that 20 million plus Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have always played an integral role in building our nation. And they do so across industries and levels. And while only 1% of that population is represented at the executive level, many more continue to make strides in passing that bamboo ceiling. Today, we want to continue to honor a few more leaders in the space who have made profound contributions in the workforce. Joining us is a panel of trailblazers in their respected industries here to speak to us about their passion, um, their work of passion. Joining us first is Kim Bowie, Vice President of CNN Special Projects, the team behind acclaimed human interest stories on the network's television and digital platforms. Among the long franchises Barnett oversees, you'll notice, is the Impact Your World and 2021 Gold Anthem award-winning champions for change. Both tap the power of storytelling to empower and inspire CNN's audience. Barnett is a founding member of the Turner Asia Business Resource Group and a mentor of, uh, with the Emmerman Angels. She also served as a board president of Refugee Family Services, now New American Pathways, as well as leadership roles with the Atlanta chapter of the Asian American Journalists Association. In 2015, Barnett was one of the inaugural CNN Diversity Ovation Award honorees, recognized for her commitment to diversity and inclusion. Up next is Rena Patel. She is the leader of the PLBY Group Playboy International Business. She is the president there with a focus on business operations, excellent partner integration optimization, and overall international strategic planning. Dr. Patel is responsible for Playboy's brand monetization across licensing, digital commerce and services, and third-party retail. Previously, Dr. Patel served as vice president licensing at IGT and brings with her experience from roles at Merrill Lynch Investment Managers, uh, Scotiabank and Sun Life Investments. Joining us next is John C. Yang. He is the President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. He leads the organization's efforts to fight for civil rights and empower Asian Americans to create a more just America for all through public policy, advocacy, education, and litigation. His extensive legal background has enabled the organization to address systematic policies, programs, and legislative attempts to discriminate against and marginalized Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and other minority communities. Mr. Yang served in the Ob Obama administration as senior advisor for trade and strategic initiatives at the US Department of Commerce. And uh, joining us also is Christy Sithophone. She is the global director, diversity, equity, and inclusion at Omnicom Public Relations Group and Omnicom Brand Consulting Group. She gets to advance systematic equity across organizations in this uh, company's uh, initiative. Previously, Christy worked at CNN Digital as a manager on the strategic initiatives team. And before CNN, she served as the director of programs and communications at Leadership Atlanta, one of the nation's most outstanding community leadership programs. Please help me welcome Kim, Rena, John, and Christy to the virtual stage. Hello, everybody. <laughs> All right, so we're we're gonna get started. We've got a team of incredible individuals, and I'm gonna take you know turns and go around and really have you introduce your culture background and how it's influenced your path in your career. We'll start with you, Kim. Well, hi everyone. First of all, Selma, thank you for the invitation and an opportunity to really learn from this panel and certainly um, from our attendees um, through questions. Um, so my culture and background, I was born here in the United States, first, uh, gener first generation Vietnamese American, um, and how it's really influenced my career path. You know, I think more recently, I recognize how family on both sides have really um, shown me, not necessarily kind of talking about it day to day, but has shown me um, how you can lead in different ways and how there are different ways you can contribute uh, to your community um, through your work and other ways. So um, I feel like it was really important to have 
um, people within my own family that I could see who were Vietnamese American, who are Asian American, um, to help guide that. Um, I would say journalism, what I, where I ultimately landed and actually knew from a er very early age that I wanted to um, pursue this career. Um, I would consider more non-traditional in terms of a career uh, among an Asian American family, but I appreciate my parents' support in that. Um, and very quickly learned um, after graduating from college that it was a bit of a family calling because my um, paternal grandparents were both journalists in Vietnam and really um, challenged political um, institutions and um, thinking really in Vietnam, which was very brave of them. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that little tidbit. How cool is that? You're continuing the legacy here. I love it. Christy. Yeah, thank you, Selma. And thank you, Kim. Um, so my parents are refugees um, from Laos. And so they came here shortly after the Vietnam War when they were sponsored into this country. And their journey alone has really, um, you know, kept me inspired and humbled. And even though from day to day, you know, as I've changed different positions and roles, they don't always understand because like Kim, I'm, I'm in a very atypical uh, position for an Asian American. Uh, you know, the, the story of my parents' journey um, to the United States is what keeps me grounded. And, um, you know, in my career, I've I've, it's been very non-linear. So I worked in uh, consulting before. I've been a nonprofit. I've been in executive search at one point. I also did that. And now working in global DEI, um, you know, it's all led me here. And what keeps me here is because through that, it's been, you know, understanding the journey that my parents have. And, and I think John mentioned it earlier, the continued feeling of being marginalized. Um, that has really shaped uh, my experience and who I am now. And I don't, I'm, I'm a huge empath. And so anytime I, I feel things a lot. And so I always think about like, what do my parents have to go through? What did my family go through? I'm also first generation college student. You know, I went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And after that, my, you know, my sister and three other cousins went there. So we almost started like a legacy with that. Um, but everything in my, in my background has shaped who I am today. And I always think about, you know, these, the amount of sacrifice. And I think you hear that a lot when you're in, especially in our AAPI community, the word sacrifice. And that again, always keeps me grounded. Lovely. Thank you for sharing that, Christy. Congratulations to you for, for being first generation college graduate too. John. <laughs> Sure, and hello to everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as some of you know, I am the executive director of an Asian American civil rights organization. And certainly for me, who I am and where I came from is foundational to why I am doing what I do today. So I am an immigrant, uh, as is about 60% of our American population, about 90% of our Asian American population are either immigrants or children of immigrants. So, you know, if we were to take a poll of this panel, I'm sure we would come up with very similar statistics. Uh, but not only am I an immigrant, but I actually was an undocumented immigrant. From about nine years old until 17 years old, my family lived, quote unquote, under the shadows or what some might call an illegal alien, right? Uh, and certainly that time and how, looking at how my parents navigated that, the fear that they had at times, the, their, their inability or unwillingness to you know, work with law enforcement if our store got robbed or to challenge a distributor if our contract gotten taken advantage of. Certainly led in the first instance for me to go into law school, but then especially in the environment of the last several years where we have seen so much xenophobia and obviously more recently so much anti-Asian hate, I did feel like it was my calling that there was this moment that I needed to dive head first into this world of nonprofit civil rights really defending our community and advancing our community's interests. And so I feel privileged and honored to be able to do that. John, thank you for doing the hard work and sharing that story with us. This is tough work and important work. So thank you so much for joining us too to share more about it. Rena, your turn. <laughs> Hi, um, 
Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Rena Patel. Uh, my mother um, immigrated from India to Canada. My father immigrated as an Indian living in South Africa, um, from South Africa to Canada. And I am the, I immigrated from Canada to America. So um, kind of on the same path as my parents moving, you know, across countries and across worlds to end up in a new place. Um, Grew up with a lot of the same expectations I think Asian families grow up with is that they wanted me to be a doctor. Um, they wanted me to be an engineer. <laughs> That's what, uh, get married, um, have some kids while you're doing all of that. Um, and I think in some ways exploring, exploring those norms, which I did, I had a pre-medical degree. I met about a hundred guys that I thought I would marry. Um, um, created a desire for me to explore what else there could be and how I could manifest that future in a way that I could bridge those expectations into paths that were a better fit uh, for who I was as an individual. And kind of in the same way they did, right? They moved across the world to kind of find their path and, and break the norms that they grew up with as well. Um, so I still, I, I think it pushed me to find a future, um, looking at how they found their future that better fit who I was, but still tied to my roots. Um, so I still studied my medical sciences, but I use that science to how I operate as a business leader. Um, I still married, but I have a same sex partner and I have two beautiful children now um, that my parents still dote on as their grandchildren uh, and my extended family around the Indian universe um, still, uh, you know, treat as their Indian grandchildren. Um, and I think it's shown me that success can manifest in our culture in different ways uh, without needing to lose your roots. Um, and I think everyone on this call has kind of, uh, you know, really shown that you can be non-traditional in that sort of Asian way in terms of your career path and, and your outcome, but still really have a strong tie to your roots and, and how your family um, showed their courage um, and, and sort of their breaking of their tradition to get you where you are today, so. I absolutely love it. I love that. And I like the way that you've um, actually talked about their journeys and yours finding themselves in, in your own, in your own way. I, I mean, I could relate. I think all of us on this call and maybe, maybe others who are listening can relate to that. Thank you for putting it in perspective. So let's dig in a little bit deeper, all right? And I'm, I'm curious to hear um, you all are, are making your own marks in, in your respective industries, and they're all quite unique industries, actually, also specifically for AAPIs. Um, what do you think, in general, has been the most impactful mark that AAPIs have left in our culture, our American culture, our politics, our business, and society? And it could be one of all the ones above or all of them if you want to tackle it. Who's ready to answer? I don't wanna, Rena, you're still unmuted if you wanna take that. <laughs> um, sure, um, I think that, you know, when people often look at the Asian community, they look at traits that, that I think I even look at as innovation, as tenacity, as grit, as hard work. But I think that when you look at Asian leaders uh, across various spectrums, their, their ability to manifest empathy and to build and bring community along with them is something that is a mark uh, that they've always left and continue to leave. And it carries lessons, I think, for other communities. Like if you just look in politics, the way the Indian community in India, uh, the Indian community, uh, and I'm speaking about the South, South Indian community, but if you could apply it to any sort of Asian community, the way the community rallies together um, uh, and the way that, the, uh, that business leaders can, can bridge that community, um, I think, and, and you know, build that community, I think is really remarkable. Um, uh, but I also think there's an element of empathy um, that, you know, the way we're raised, the way that uh, we raise our children, the way that we look, I think it was Christy that talked about uh, being an empath. I think that's something that is um, a part of all of us as, as Asians. Um, and I think that that is also an area that we leave a mark. And I'm not being very specific, but I'm talking more about the traits that we have that leave marks um, in, in the community. And Socially. I think dovetailing off of what Rena's um, just said, it, we're seeing it now, how the Asian community is galvanizing around um, combating anti-Asian hate, you know, what, what John, Christy, and Rena are all working 
towards um, just seeing the allyship um, in response to all forms of discrimination, not just anti-Asian hate. I think it goes back to what Rena is saying with the empathy and, and how um, we as a community lean on each other, but also reach out to other communities. I know from a journalism perspective, um, I've seen a shift in coverage. Uh, I think just more integration of um, diverse perspectives um, and a greater effort to reflect the stories of people's lived experiences. Um, so that sort of externally, what we're seeing with journalism and I think internally within various journalism organizations, there's um, a, a greater effort for a more inclusive newsroom and there's still work to be done, but I am seeing um, people within my own organization, myself, it takes courage to speak up, right? So I'm seeing people from diverse backgrounds um, really bring up maybe topics or suggestions that were previously difficult to talk about in these editorial meetings. Um, and I think it's really encouraging. So my world is more in the world of politics, if you will, in small p, being here in DC and work, working on advocacy. So let me think about it from the representation standpoint with respect to politics. And I'll use two specific examples. One is Norm Mineta, who many of you probably know his name. He was the Secretary of Commerce for Bill Clinton and then the Secretary of, Com uh, Secretary of Transportation for George W. Bush, many other aqualites, former uh, person that was incarcerated during World War II as a child. After 9-11, he was in charge of basically bringing all of the planes down safely into the airports. In his first meeting with President Bush, after all of that, after they briefed President Bush on what was happening, et cetera, et cetera, he asked for a private audience with President Bush just for one minute. And in that private audience, he later told a number of us, he emphasized to President Bush, I've been through this before, and I am worried that what we saw during the Japanese American incarceration will happen again to the Muslim South Asian Middle Eastern community. So I would ask you to make sure to make some public remarks about how we are not targeting the Memza community, but this is something that we are just mm -hmm. focused on terrorism. And that, among other things, led President Bush to you know, make a trip to a mosque and make those types of statements. Second example I would use is with respect to the Muslim ban. Um, when the Muslim ban happened, you know, a number of organizations litigated and three lawsuits, one in New York, one in Maryland, one in Hawaii. Two of those lawsuits, uh, there was an Asian American judge who presided over those lawsuits. And I, I did not know how those judges would rule. They were people I actually had the fortune of knowing. But just knowing that there was an Asian American judge gave me great comfort because we knew that this was someone that understood the immigrant experience, understand that foreigner experience and would be able to sort of represent. And so I think what I wanna make sure my message is this, is from whatever place where you sit, where you have a voice, exercise that voice and have that courage to exercise that voice because that's needed. Oh, John, thank you so much for educating us on this. This was like really fascinating to hear about that and the impact behind the scenes that really come to fruition that impact everybody else um, at the out as an outcome. I'm going to take us this this and I knew this was going to go fast. We're at 12:42, so I want to make sure that we go into the next question. Um, you know, we've talked a bit about some of the um, uh, I guess the stigmas and also the stereotypes um, in your journeys that you've had to break through or change or figure out. Um, walk us through the challenges that are specifically related to building your career that may have been related to you coming from an AAPI background. Christy? Yeah, so I mentioned, this is a great question. I mentioned earlier, um, I've never, you know, there's like this meme out there that it's like, you know, will be disowned by Asian family if you're like not a doctor, not an engineer, but like it, it, it just was hilarious to me because I feel like I'm totally, I would be disowned in a sense, right? Because I'm not in that way. And, and for me, um, I think it's, I have transitioned so much like in industries, but 
the hard part was actually trying to translate some of those skills. And so those are the kind of things that you aren't taught in college. And then of course, my parents being refugees to this country, I had to figure it, it all out myself. Like when you go to college, you're thinking, I wish I was taught how to save more. You know, when our parents came, when my parents came here, they literally just had to figure it out. Um, and I had to figure it out too, being the first person to go, go to college and graduate and like become an adult. So, you know, trying to figure out the salary piece, like negotiating your salary and asking for more because you might not feel like you're worthy. Um, and I had to learn that later. Like now I know, okay, I need to ask for whatever they offer me, offer 10% more. Um, go after that job, even if you think you're not qualified. And I think that was, that's been tough for me. I mean, before I actually got to CNN Digital and was trying to leave nonprofit, I struggled. I applied for two years and it was hard to figure out like, how do I take what I know I'm good at and sell that, sell myself on that. Um, and I have really strong soft skills. I can talk to anybody, but it was like trying to sell like some of the hard skills, which is, you know, the technical qualifications was really tough. And I think that, you know, when you're talking about talent advocacy and recruitment, that conversation needs to be had more and even more so for our community in particular, because we're not good at selling ourselves. And I think my path and I, I was in sales for a while too, that personally helped me, but I wonder if, you know, if we focus more on that, that could help our community more. So that, those are some of the challenges that I faced of trying to transition and, and sell myself in different ways. Fair enough. And I, I think in some way, shape or form, it ties into what John was saying, speaking up in general. So not mm -hmm. just speaking up on, on behalf of others and advocating for what's going on, but speaking up on behalf of yourself. And I would have to agree. Who else would like to share? Um, Kim? Yeah, I mean, I can relate to so much of what Christy just shared. Um, you know, I think as I think about my career path, primarily at CNN, I'm celebrating 27 years coming up. So I've worked in different departments and have done different things in those 27 years. So um, just recognizing the norms in different work situations and really figuring out how, how do I authentically participate when there are certain norms? Um, and if those norms clearly are not serving the majority or many of the people, um, how do I be a change agent, right? Without um, jeopardizing my career or feeling, um, somehow that it's going to affect me negatively. And um, I think actually being within one company has helped me navigate that and gain confidence and find allies and people to help advocate um, and jump in and reinforce certain things that I may say in a meeting. Uh, so I feel like that's probably the, the biggest challenge and probably will be going forward, but um, finding what, like to what Johnny said earlier in the session um, during his um, sharing, it's being confident in your authenticity and then really finding a way to share it with people so um, that it helps more than just you so that it can, can be an example to others. I love that, absolutely. Um, Rena, would you like to add anything for John before we go into the next question? Any challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the challenges um, are, are similar to a lot of challenges many mi minority workers in general face, and that's that we struggle to find representation, community, and understanding in the workforce. Um, I think I, I was raised in a way, like many of us, to, to tolerate. You know, we, we learn to tolerate certain things where we learn, I have learned, don't rock the boat, keep your head down, just do good work. Um, but the world has changed and, you know, we keeping our head down, hiding, pretending to be invisible is stifling. Um, it could be traumatic. It could be an inhibitor to good work. It could be 
an inhibitor to long-term success, you might not find the good workers because they're hiding in a corner. Um, and so I think representation really matters in, in that sort of finding your allies, finding your voice, how to sort of uh, bring that voice up. Like, you know, I think for myself as well, being, bring, being at a company for so, so many years has helped me find those allies in that community and, and be more confident. But in the early years, um, uh, uh, it, it was very much that fear of like, oh, if I rock the boat, what will happen? You know, that sort of, even as a woman, like the idea that you have to just keep your head down. Um, I think it was the most challenging. Not sure what's going on, <laughs> but we're getting a little bit of some technical. You're, you're, you're rocking the boat on this screen, Rena. Yeah. So you're, <laughs> you're doing great. I, I, uh, couldn't agree with you more. Um, thank you for bringing that up because I do think the representation, especially at the leadership level, is the most challenging in general because obviously when we see that representation exist at that level, then we feel like we can get to that level, right? We can do more, be more. We have an ally there. Um, and so it makes a huge difference. And so going from challenges, I wanna tap into a different question, the opposite end of that, right? Which of your accomplishments, and I know you all are accomplished, this is this is not just me asking you to like toot your own horn, although we will be tooting for you, but I really am curious, which of your accomplishments that uh, make you the proudest, um, and the proudest in terms of like as a contributor in your space, um, it could be community related, it could be work related, and if you could tie it into AAPI and the impact that that may have left for other individuals in that space. John, we'll start with you. <laughs> sure, and I'll admit I'm at an advantage in some ways because I am at an organization that that's our focus with respect to the Asian American community. I, I think there's one at a global level, one at a my, um, micro level. The global level is uh, one of the things that we did during this moment that we've been facing of anti-Asian hate was uh, pretty quickly on, we saw this coming. And so we created what was called the Bystander Intervention Program. Uh, we did this in conjunction with an organization called Right to Be. And this basically gives people techniques. If they see someone being bullied, they see someone uh, having racial epithets hurled at them, they are equipped with things to do. You know, we're not asking people to be superheroes, but often in those times, there are small things that can be done that minimizes the trauma for the victim. And so over these past two years, we've trained over 120,000 people. Uh, and I get reports all the time about individuals that, that come up to my staff members or even to me and say, hey, I, I use this in such and such situation. And just to think that our training was able to minimize trauma for these individuals is just certainly so meaningful to me. At a micro level, there are individual cases uh, that, that where we represent individuals. And in one particular case, uh, right now, there's a lot of racial profiling of Chinese American scientists because of our tensions with, with the Chinese government. And so one particular case and a case involving a doctor named Dr. An Ming Hu in Tennessee, uh, we were finally able to get the Department of Justice to drop their appeal against him. Um, and just to see, not his face, but his wife and his child's face when they got the news, uh, it was just wonderful, it was just wonderful. Amazing, John, we're gonna have to tap into you for the training, all right, for Yardstick. So watch out now. I, I can sense maybe a possible partnership there, which would be great for our clients. Um, all right, who wants to, to share next? Proudest moment, Kim. You know, I think, generally speaking with what we've all been through, through with the pandemic over the last three years. Um, I'm really proud of how our team pivoted. Um, you know, the core work that we do brings us into communities. It takes us out in the field and not being able to do that initially when the pandemic broke, but still having stories to tell um, an impact to make. Uh, I'm really proud of how um, we were able to pivot and um, very quickly find different ways to bring the stories of various communities during a, a really challenging time around the world. Um, I think specific to the Asian American and just Asian population is getting stories out about mental health. 
Um, it's um, a difficult and sometimes taboo topic among um, Asians and Asian Americans. And uh, Julia Chan on my team pulled together. I mean, it's Asian Pacific Heritage Month, but it's also Mental Health Month as well. Um, so these are resources and interviews with professionals that understand the culture and understand the stigma. Um, and providing our community with that resource is something I'm really proud of. Um, and for all different communities, um, you know, we, we really expanded that offering to our audience so that it was targeted to the specific, whether it's a Black community. Um, and I think there's nuance in that that can be really difficult. Um, but when you have a diverse staff and you have an organization that is truly trying to embrace that, then um, you can get at that nuance and really provide, um, hopefully, a service that um, is helpful. So those are just two areas that come to mind. Keep rocking, Ken. Th those are incredible um, stories. And I see that, that John already put that in the chat, the, the wonderful reporting on anti-Asian hate. I have to agree with that. It's, it's been really fascinating to watch. Um, we're, we're a little short on time. So I wanna make sure that we get this last question in and I wanna give each one of you a minute or so to respond to it. Cause I think this is a really important question for all of the decision makers that are joining us today in this virtual space. What piece of advice in about a minute, okay, would you give these decision makers, um, maybe even in your respective fields or across fields and industries, right, to create a truly inclusive workforce that allows for the thriving of AAPIs? Rena or Christy, one of you may start. <laughs> Go for yeah, it, Chris. I can jump in here, and it's a little bit related to what I was going to respond to in the last question. But for me, I think that when you're building teams or uh, building programs or events, you know, the way I look at things is I'm always assessing any gaps. So if you're trying to be truly inclusive, think about whose voice is not being represented here. Um, I'm the president of NAP Atlanta, which is the National Association of Asian American Professionals. And I can truly say we're finally Pan-Asian as a board. We have South Asian, we have Southeast Asian, we have East Asian. Even in our membership, we actually have a few Pacific Islanders. You know, we all say AAPI, but do you actually have someone PI? Mm -hmm. And if you're going to include NH, well, do you actually have someone Native Hawaiian? So ask those questions, you know, what are we missing here? Who's not at the table? And do we just need to, you know, build a new table? I don't know, but be, don't be afraid to even challenge, you know, your own thoughts and perspectives. And I think that's how you continue to be better and truly be more inclusive. Very good advice. Rena. I would say mine are probably three quick things. Don't be invisible. Um, share your own unique experiences, but also be an active listener to the experience of others and truly commit to DEI in your organization and the implementation of it. So don't just talk about it and then don't actually see it through, but the implementation of it is important. And I still see too many organizations that talk about it. Yeah, it's part of a, our mission or whatever, but they're not taking the steps to actually implement those practices. Um, because without that, you're, everything else kind of falls apart. So, I think that's so important, Rena, that it's the commitment to inclusion for the long haul. I know that um, with George Floyd and anti-Asian hate, you know, there are these moments. But if, um, as a leader, you can keep reminding people on a day to day and speak up so much of what everyone has said, um, that and show and act as you know, as you know, we are committed and we're committed for the long haul. And I think reminding people um, to speak up um, for the value and not against someone, right? We had this wonderful speaker, John Amici, who, who said that you want to be clear on what you stand for, but when you do speak up, the way you galvanize people is to not speak against others, but really speak for the value. And that has really stuck with me. Mm, I love that. 
John. The last thing I would add, I completely agree with everyone, especially on active listening and, and really a true commitment implementation would be data and metrics, right? For many organizations, this goes to what Rena is saying about are they really in this for the long haul? Uh, and part of how you make sure you're in it for the long haul is you are gathering data about sort of where there is under-inclusiveness, what places are underrepresented. You know, the fact you look at our panel, it, the Asian American community is very diverse. So making sure that it includes all of that diversity. And then what are your benchmarks that you are, you are offering? And are you achieving those benchmarks? Because that's how you tell whether you're committed and you're actually making progress. I absolutely love that. It's a, it's a quite comprehensive list of advice team. Take it, walk away with it. Thank you for your time, your energy, your contribution. Thanks, Kim, Christy, Rena, and John for joining us today.